Okay, so we're going to get started. Um, and uh, thanks everyone so much for, for joining us. Uh, I'm Sarah Buchanan, and I, uh, I work in environmental defense on our climate change team. And I want to begin by acknowledging that I'm here uh, in Toronto. I know folks are, are zooming in from uh, lots of different places, uh, but I'm here in Toronto on the traditional territory of the Wendat, the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Chippewa, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. And that Toronto is in the Dish With One Spoon territory. Um, and Toronto is now home to many diverse First Nations, uh, Métis and Inuit peoples. I also want to acknowledge that the issues that we're talking about today, both air pollution and climate change, of uh, course, Indigenous communities, as well as racialized communities and low-income communities. So as someone who personally works in the environmental movement, uh, I know we have a lot of work to do in recognizing and addressing this. Um, so uh, I'll ask Tessa to put up the project team slide here. So this work is a uh, unique collaboration. Uh, you'll see folks um, on this slide presenting today who, um, <clears throat> who have joined us from, from different sectors. Uh, it's a unique, unique collaboration between Environmental Defense, where I work, the Ontario Public Health Association, and the University of Toronto's Transportation and Air Quality Research Group. Um, this work was uh, funded by the Atmospheric Fund and Tides Canada Dragonfly Fund, so I really want to acknowledge that and thank them for, uh, for that support. And the work was also guided by uh, a really important advisory committee of folks uh, who are experts in both uh, public health and in climate change and vehicle electrification. Um, so having folks from all those fields together uh, really helped scope work that was relevant to all of those fields. And we came together to build uh, more evidence for action to reduce the health impacts of both air pollution and climate change. Um, we know that air pollution and carbon pollution come out of the same vehicle tailpipes. Uh, so there was a recognition that we could work together here and that we could look at solutions to help mitigate both of these issues. And then today we're also going to hear, uh, I'm really excited to hear from Dr. Lawrence Lowe, who is the Region of Peel's Interim Medical Officer of Health. And he's also the co-chair of the Ontario Public Health Association's Built Environment uh, Working Group. And then, uh, Tessa, if you can put up the agenda slide. Uh, just some quick logistics. We're going to be taking uh, your questions in the second half of this hour. So if you have questions, great. You can type them into the Q&A box um, that's uh, at the, I think, right side of your bottom panel on your Zoom panel. And uh, we'll get to them, uh, we'll gather them for later. You can also use the chat box if you want for general chat, uh, but try to keep your questions for presenters in the Q&A box so we can keep them all organized. Okay, next slide. Okay, um, actually you can probably go to the next slide again. So um, this map, uh, these maps show uh, a lot of the, the crux of our work. Um, our, our modeling that, uh, that really was, was the hard work of Laura, who's gonna be talking later in this call, and, and Marianne. Um, this modeling shows pretty definitively that switching to electric cars and SUVs, electric public transit buses, and cleaner, more efficient trucks will dramatically reduce traffic-related air pollution. So you can see these maps here of the Greater Toronto-Hamilton area. And these maps are of nitrogen dioxide levels from an average day on the left, compared with three of the scenarios that we modeled on the right. Laura's gonna get more into more detail on the results um, later in this webinar. But if you look closely, you can see that obviously there's, there's some areas that are harder hit by air pollution uh, than others. And there's some areas that are gonna be, um, have, have see greater reductions of nitrogen dioxide and many other pollutants um, from cleaner vehicles. And if you look closely here, you can see that people who live near major roads are exposed to more air pollution. Um, it sounds very simple, and it is. Our modeling shows that, that these folks who do live to closer to um, major roads and highways, and I don't mean just highways. This is also um, you know, roads like I live next to Dundas Street uh, in Toronto, and that's a major road. And these folks are currently most exposed 
And the folks that are most exposed would experience the greatest health benefits of the solutions that would reduce this traffic related air pollution uh, with cleaner vehicles. And studies have consistently shown that low income communities and racialized communities are disproportionately located close to sources of pollution like highways. Uh, next slide, please. So this improvement in air quality uh, will lead to health benefits for all residents in the Greater Toronto Hamilton area. And it'll prevent hundreds of premature deaths every year and provide billions of dollars in social benefits every year. Um, for example, switching to 100% uh, electric cars, passenger vehicles, um, our modeling shows that will prevent 313 premature deaths every year across the Greater Toronto Hamilton area. And this graph uh, from the report breaks it down by scenario and also by region. Now you'll see that there's, uh, there's more prevented deaths in Toronto. Toronto has a much higher population. Uh, so exposure wise, um, that density means there's going to be greater impact per person. Uh, again, Laura's gonna talk a little bit more about those kind of results later. Okay, next slide. So there are also very uh, significant climate change benefits to uh, switching to cleaner vehicles like electric vehicles. Um, so our modeling showed that um, switching to electric cars and SUVs, switching to electric tra public transit buses, and even switching to more efficient trucks will dramatically reduce greenhouse gas emissions and help slow the impacts of climate change. Uh, for example, if every car in the GTHA were electric, we'd reduce uh, carbon pollution from transportation in the region by nearly 70%. And that uh, it evens out to about eight megatons. And to give you some perspective on what eight megatons means, uh, in Ontario, every year, we produce about 160 megatons total from all sources. Um, so eight megatons is actually pretty significant. And one of the reasons that we came together to, to do this project um, was that we've seen an emphasis on the very real climate benefits of electric vehicles. And, we, we haven't seen as much of an emphasis on the health benefits of cleaner vehicles. Um, and health is such a personal thing. It's, it really resonates with many people and policymakers in a way that maybe greenhouse gas emissions don't at the moment. So we wanted to bring this lens to our push for a shift to these cleaner vehicles um, in order to achieve these health benefits. And so um, now we're gonna hear from uh, Dr. Lawrence Lowe who is the Region of Peel's uh, Interim Medical Officer of Health and also the co-chair of the Ontario Public Health As Association's Built Environment Working Group. Um, so next slide. And I will, uh, I will hand it over to Dr. Lowe to say a few words. I'm not sure if he's logged in yet. Um, Helen, maybe I'll, uh, I'll pass it over to you to, uh, to get started and then we'll uh, have Dr. Lowe in whenever he can join. For sure. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I, I saw that um, Dr. Lowe was just having trouble getting the mic set up, but um, as soon as uh, he joins, I, I know he can hear us, but as soon as he joins, please interrupt me and I can continue on uh, after that. So. Um, maybe just move to the next slide. Thanks. So OPHA, we're very grateful to be part of this uh, project and this report. I'm a volunteer with the Ontario Public Health Association and I chair the Environmental Health Work Group. So we were interested because it aligns with the work that we're doing, our environmental health programs and, and some of the health equity work we're engaging in. And our, one of our campaigns, our health focused climate communication campaign, we have messages that includes health protection messages on air quality. So this research is going to help that. And it also supports public health units across Ontario. So health units are mandated under the Ontario Public Health Standards to deliver various programs. The Healthy Environments Program requires health units to do many things to reduce exposures to health hazards. And one is to use data to influence and inform the development 
of local health and public policy to reduce exposures to health hazards. And one of the outcomes, hopefully, is that, okay, it looks like Lawrence is ready. I'll just finish this slide and then I'll pass it over to Lawrence. The last point there about decreasing health equities is one of the program outcomes. So uh, I do hope that as uh, health units get this information that they will be able to use this to support some of the work they're doing on healthy, building healthy communities and on promoting active and sustainable transportation as they're often, they work with municipal partners and they're asked to bring the health evidence to bear to, to help inform those policies. So if we'll move back two slides and, and Dr. Lowell can speak and I'll continue after. Thank you, Helen, and thank you, everyone. Sorry, I must have clicked on the wrong link, and uh, for some reason I was uh, hearing the, the excellent webinar that was going on, but unfortunately I uh, wasn't able to speak. Um, I did want to say that I am pleased to uh, offer some opening remarks at the session today. I regret that I'm unable to stay uh, for the whole thing, but I uh, am very much looking forward uh, to uh, reading uh, the Cleaning the Air report uh, and certainly in, encourage uh, uh, a fulsome discussion amongst all the panelists and the authors here. Um, in my role as Interim Medical Officer of Health uh, for the Region of Peel and co-chair of the Built Environment Working Group, I recognize that the Cleaning the Air report is, uh, is highly important uh, for uh, myself and uh, for uh, my public health colleagues. Uh, we do know uh, that exposure to traffic-related air pollution uh, causes a significant burden of illness in our community. Um, I believe as Sarah also identified, uh, you know, it, it also contributes to uh, concerns around uh, climate change uh, because it all comes from the same uh, same tailpipe. Uh, and as public health agencies and partners uh, continue to prioritize the COVID-19 response, uh, we must uh, continue to recognize the need uh, to work on all other critical uh, public health programs as well, um, including air quality. Ultimately, um, air quality is something that has been a public health concern and issue uh, from well before COVID-19 and will continue to be uh, something that we must work on uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the near future. Uh, the Canada's uh, Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Teresa Tam, pointed out in her update on June 6th uh, that uh, this is one area where our response to COVID-19 may actually be having a positive health impact uh, with major cities worldwide uh, and also here in Canada seeing a reduction in air pollution amidst uh, closures and curtailments. Um, and so given that there are people with underlying health conditions and also those that are uh, very vulnerable to severe outcomes from COVID-19, uh, Dr. Tam also stressed that it is important for all of us uh, to continue doing our part to reduce uh, the overall level of air pollution uh, in our communities. Um, and so we know that uh, reducing traffic related air pollution and especially uh, transportation as a whole being one of the largest drivers in my region uh, and uh, throughout Canada uh, by using cleaner vehicles uh, will be one step towards improving uh, air quality and human health. Um, Peel's uh, 2019 Comprehensive Health Status Report actually put a, a number on this. Uh, it was identified that traffic related emissions uh, in the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area are estimated to be responsible for up to 1,000 premature deaths uh, and nearly 4,000 hospitalizations each year. And while air quality has improved in the region of Peel uh, over the recent decades, uh, as I've stated, transportation related air pollution uh, remains a, a significant uh, source of exposure, a significant contributor uh, to uh, pollutants in the air for residents of Peel, uh, especially given our community's makeup of uh, you know, significantly large roads and highways uh, and the uh, dependence on traveling in motor vehicles and single occupant uh, cars typically. Uh, we also know that uh, almost half of our, over half of our population lives within uh, 300 meters of a high traffic corridor. Uh, and this also includes 69% of long-term care facilities and 30% uh, of licensed daycares, which are within uh, this 300 meter zone, also uh, taken from our uh, 2019 health report. And we also discovered uh, through our continued uh, examination and assessment of the uh, air quality and human health risks uh, at uh, Toronto Pierce Airport, um, that uh, traffic on the major highways around the airport uh, still do contribute more uh, to poor air quality than, uh, than, the, than the actual air traffic at the airport itself. Uh, and finally, also in the region of Peel, where uh, transports and logistics are a significant uh, economic driver, we know that freight delivery is also a significant source of transportation and traffic related air pollution. Uh, 68,000 vehicles uh, transporting goods on Peel's roads every single day at normal times. And we have been uh, very supportive of the region's off-peak uh, delivery pilot program 
uh, which uh, has helped to improve air quality uh, by shifting uh, the timing by which that uh, delivery is occurring and uh, reducing uh, traffic congestion the amount of time that these trucks spend idling in our community. So those are just a few examples that demonstrate how we at Peel have uh, tried to address uh, traffic uh, related air pollution and, uh, and its impacts on health. Um, and I encourage uh, and look forward uh, to hearing about how the panel goes. I encourage all of you to uh, learn from the experts uh, and explore how we can continue to leverage the findings of this report to advocate for transportation policies and improved community health. So uh, with that, I'll conclude my remarks. I'll pass it back to Helen. I'll be able to stay on for a little while longer, but unfortunately we'll need to go on to another commitment. But I wanna thank all of you for the opportunity to speak today and certainly for the important work that you're doing uh, to address uh, and improve uh, air quality to improve our health. So thank you and I'll pass it back to you, Helen. Thanks so much, Dr. Lowe. It's so important to hear from public health leaders like yourself who are on the front lines of protecting health, whether it's from infectious diseases or environmental exposures, and also how some of the health evidence supports public health work. So if we could, that brings us to the health evidence. If we could move to the next slide, please. So in the next few slides, I'll be presenting information that comes from research from Health Canada's report, Health Impacts of Air Pollution in Canada, and also research from other agencies, local and federal. So despite improvements in air quality in Canada, air pollution continues to have serious impacts on population health, including over 14,000 annual deaths in Canada attributed to air pollution, and that number is over 3,000 in the Greater Toronto Hamilton area millions of asthma and acute respiratory symptom days every year, and thousands of hospital and emergency department visits due to cardiac and respiratory conditions. Next slide. So these impacts are based on exposure to three pollutants, fine particulate matter, nitrogen dioxide, and ozone, and they're responsible or they account for the majority of health impacts. Next slide. So fine particulate matter is responsible for 9,700 premature deaths every year in Canada and it's linked to cardiovascular disease and respiratory conditions. And another important point, there's no threshold with which, below which no impact has been observed. And black carbon is a major component of PM 2.5. That will be important later on in our presentation. Next slide, nitrogen dioxide is responsible for 940 premature deaths every year and linked to respiratory conditions. It's especially harmful for people with asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Next slide. And ozone is responsible for 44,000 deaths every year and is linked to respiratory conditions as well. Next slide. So, well, health risk is both a factor of sensitivity and exposure. Populations more sensitive to the health impacts of air pollution are older adults, young children, people with existing heart or lung conditions, and people with diabetes. People experiencing health inequities are more likely to be living with existing medical conditions, which puts them at a greater risk from exposure to air pollution. And those that are um, at greater exposure to air pollution are those that are active outdoors or living near high traffic corridors, which brings us to traffic related air pollution. The next slide. So there's a significant body of evidence associating traffic related air pollution to adverse health outcomes, including cardiovascular health, respiratory health outcomes, followed by cancer. So as given that the health risk is highest near busy roads and that a large percentage of the population in the greater Toronto Hamilton area lives, works, plays, or commutes near busy roads, it's a serious public health concern. A Toronto assessment revealed that almost half of premature deaths and over half of hospital admissions due to air pollution emitted from Toronto sources were attributed to exposure to traffic pollution. And uh, Dr. Lowe just mentioned the report of the, the Chief or of Medical Officers of Health in the Greater Toronto Hamilton area, up to a thousand premature deaths from exposure to trap. And in our clearing the air report, our modeling estimates that traps from cars, trucks, and buses is responsible for 872 premature deaths in the Greater Toronto Hamilton area every year. Next slide, thanks. So while more work needs to be done, evidence from Canadian studies reveals that exposure to traffic related air pollution is inequitably distributed with people living close to busy roads being more likely to experience health inequities. 
So a Toronto study revealed that over 60% of long-term care homes, 50% of child care centers, and 43% of schools are located near major roads and highways. And our research, while we were unable to draw specific conclusions on our, in our modeling in terms of socioeconomic status, tra traffic exposure, and health and health equity outcomes, Research does show that marginalized populations are, are proportionally, more proportionally, disproportionately exposed to air pollution. They would benefit the most from cleaner vehicles on the road. So on the next slide, and Dr. Lowe mentioned some of this as well, we're hearing uh, more information about the link between um, air pollution and COVID. So it was important to see Dr. Tam mentioning that in her update last week, and also on the Government of Canada's website, the Clean Air Day website, they also include statements on the emerging evidence relating increased COVID risk to uh, people, increased risk for people that are exposed to higher levels of air pollution. So as these, the lockdowns are lifting, as we, maybe we did see a reduction in air pollution during the lockdowns, as the lockdown is being lifted, we're seeing these air pollution levels increase. That was a, that was just temporary reduction. We need permanent solutions to reduce exposure to traps and improve health. And I'll pass it over to Laura and she can give us some of that information. Thanks. All right, thank you, Helen. Uh, so now I'm going to discuss the modeling approach we've used for this study and present the main results of the report. Um, so our framework is developed around a chemical transport model that simulate, simulates the physical dispersion and chemical reactions of air pollutants. And this type of model uses information on land use, metrology, and emissions to simulate air pollutant concentrations over a grid of one by one kilometer. Next. Um, the emission inventory is very important for this type of model and having the most refined inventory possible is essential. Uh, so we need to take into account all possible sources of air pollutant emissions, anthropogenic sources such as power plants, traffic, industries, and other sources such as agriculture and shipping, as well as natural sources such as the vegetation. Next. Since traffic is the largest source of emissions in cities, it's important to have a traffic emission inventory as detailed as possible. Uh, we use the results of a traffic assignment model based on travel survey data, and we combine this information with emission factors to get an emission inventory for private passenger vehicles, transit buses, and commercial vehicles. Next. Then, to evaluate the impact of changes of air pollutant concentrations on human health, we assess the health outcomes associated with changes in air quality in terms of number of years of life lost and number of premature death. And for this, we used concentration response functions, which relate a change in air pollutant exposure with a change in risk of mortality. Next. And finally, we supplemented this assessment of health outcomes with an economic valuation of the social benefits associated with these numbers of premature death. Uh, so for this, we used a value of statistical life, or BSL, which represents how much people are willing to pay to reduce their risk of death. So for instance, a VSL can include the wage premium required to attract employees to do dangerous work or the willingness to pay for improved vehicle safety features. Um, the VSL captures the value of reduced risk of premature death, but it does not include healthcare costs. And so the economic valuation we have presented in our report is expected to underestimate the actual social benefits associated with improvements in air quality. Next. Um, the study area we uh, focused on is the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area, the GTHA, uh, and it houses about 7 million inhabitants and it's divided into six regional municipalities. About a third of the, the inhabitants of the region live in Toronto, and Peel and York are the next most populated regions. Uh, we based our study on data from 2016, which is our reference year. Next. Um, we first developed a traffic emission inventory for cars and SUVs, trucks and public transit buses. So trucks in yellow are responsible for more than half of the traffic related nitrogen oxide, NOx emissions in the GTHA. And cars and their SUVs, which are in orange, are also responsible for large amount of NOx emissions. Uh, trucks are the largest emitters of traffic related PM2.5 and black carbon and they represent almost 70% of these emissions. 
but it's cars and SUVs that are responsible for the largest portion of greenhouse gas or GHG emissions. In general, the public transit buses represent a small portion of the total traffic emissions, but they're important because they operate in densely populated areas. Next. So the first question we explored concerned the health burdens of the different vehicle types. We wanted to see how we can guide policies to target the vehicle that has the most impact on human health. So these maps show the years of life lost per 100,000 inhabitants attributed to each vehicle category. Uh, the red color displays the location with the highest number of years of life lost per capita. We see that the population losing the most years of life due to private passenger vehicles and commercial vehicles is located mainly along the highways and around the airport. Uh, the region of Peel, which is uh, known to have substantial truck traffic, is clearly affected by trucks especially around the airport, which draws in a lot of commercial vehicle traffic. Um, the spatial distribution is different for transit buses on the right, uh, because though they mainly drive in the city of Toronto, and so the population the most affected by emissions from buses lives in Toronto. Uh, we've also indicated here on the map the total number of premature deaths that are induced by the emissions of each vehicle category. And we see that all vehicles are responsible for a large number of premature deaths every year, but trucks are inducing the highest number of premature deaths. Um, as we've seen before, tackling the emissions from cars uh, would help decrease a large portion of the greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector, uh, but it's tackling the emissions from cars and commercial vehicles that would uh, be the most beneficial in terms of uh, health effects. Next. So here this graph summarizes the annual social costs attributed to each vehicle type for each region. The three regions the most affected are Toronto, Peel, and New York, which is not surprising because these are the regions with the most important traffic, in particular Toronto, and Peel for truck traffic. Uh, trucks are responsible for the larger social costs in all regions. Per capita, Toronto is the most affected, followed by Peel and New York. Um, the distribution is the same for cars, but with a stronger difference between Toronto and Peel, uh, which really highlights the large amount of private passenger traffic in the city of Toronto. Uh, in comparison, we see that transit buses induce lower social costs, but they still have a substantial impact, especially in Toronto. Next. Renewing the fleets of on-road vehicles with cleaner vehicles is a way of reducing emissions of greenhouse gases and air pollutants because more recent vehicles are usually more efficient. So then we explored the health benefits associated with the renewal of different uh, fleets of on-road vehicles. Next. So to study the impact of having cleaner vehicle fits on population exposure and health, we considered a base case with only gasoline-fueled private cars and SUVs, diesel-fueled transit buses, and gasoline and diesel-fueled commercial vehicles. And then we designed three scenarios. So the first one, we have 100% electric vehicles. So all cars and SUVs are electric. Um, the deployment of electric cars and SUVs is often seen as the best opportunity to reduce greenhouse gas emissions because cars are responsible for the largest amount of greenhouse gas emissions. The second scenario is 100% of electric buses. So all transit buses are electric. Even though buses are not responsible for large greenhouse gas and air pollutant emissions, um, replacing buses with electric buses is often seen as a worthy investment because there are very few transit buses uh, compared to the number of cars. And our third scenario is called cleaner trucks. So here we assume that the trucks have recently been renewed and they're all younger than eight years old. The rationale behind this choice is that there has been a dramatic improvement in air pollutant emissions of new trucks and electric trucks are not yet a viable solution on a large scale. Uh, we've chosen eight years uh, to align with existing scrappage program that provides financial incentives for renewing vehicles older than eight or 10 years. Next. So here this graph shows the reductions in traffic-related greenhouse gas emissions achieved under each scenario. We see that deploying electric cars and SUVs will lead to the greatest reduction in total emissions, with total greenhouse gas emissions about two-thirds lower than under the base case. Uh, this is the case even when we consider the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the production of electricity, uh, which is indicated in green on the graph. 
Having electric buses or cleaner trucks will have little impact on the total traffic-related greenhouse gas emissions, which is because trucks and buses are not responsible for a large portion of traffic-related greenhouse gas emissions. Next. So here we see on this graph the annual social benefits that would be achieved with the complete deployment of electric cars and SUVs. Uh, proportionally, there are greater social benefits for residents of Toronto, Peel, and York region because the air quality of these regions is the most affected by traffic emissions. On the left, there are some key numbers associated with this scenario. So, a oh, 313 premature death would be prevented with uh, this scenario, which is very close to the total number of premature deaths that are attributed to cars and SUVs. This corresponds to a total of $2.4 billion per year in social benefits and a reduction of 7.6 megatons of DAG emissions every year. And this can be translated into almost $10,000 of social benefits obtained for the deployment of each uh, electric car. And it's not only the electric vehicle owners that would benefit from an electrification of the vehicle fleet, but everyone living in the GTH. Next. So here in this slide, I presented the result for the electric buses scenario. The greatest benefits are for the residents of the city of Toronto, because this is where most traffic buses circulate. All the premature death induced by emission from transit buses will be saved with the complete deployment of electric buses. And this corresponds to $1.1 billion uh, in social benefits per year. Uh, there are only 0 0.3 megatons of greenhouse gas emissions that would annually be saved under this scenario, but this is very close to the total greenhouse gas emissions attributed to transit buses. It's actually 90% uh, of uh, the transit buses greenhouse gas emissions. Next. And finally here, we have the results for the last scenario with cleaner trucks. So the population from the regions uh, where truck traffic is concentrated would benefit from an improvement of air quality. Uh, the total number of premature deaths prevented under this scenario is 275, and this is quite lower than uh, the 407 premature deaths that are attributed to commercial vehicles in the GTHA. But this is because in this case, we're only renewing existing diesel trucks with other diesel trucks. So we're not completely cutting off the exhaust emissions from trucks. Uh, but this still corresponds to $2.1 billion per year in social benefits. Uh, but having cleaner trucks would have very little impact over the total traffic-related greenhouse gas emissions. Next. So to put in perspective the results of the three scenarios, we combine maps of the social benefits per 100,000 inhabitants. The color scheme is the same for the three maps, and we've also indicated at the bottom the greenhouse gas emission that would be saved daily under each of the three scenarios. So we see here that 100% electric cars and SUV, which is on the left, and the cleaner truck scenario on the right would lead to similar health benefits. Um, but it's electrifying the private uh, passenger vehicles, cars and SUV, that is a lot more beneficial in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. The region of Toronto is always benefiting the most from the strategies implemented, but we also see that under the cleaner truck scenario, the region of Peel would greatly benefit from improvements in air quality. We've seen here that tackling emissions from cars and trucks would lead to the biggest improvements in air quality and the biggest decreases in greenhouse gas emissions, but it's also important to target transit buses because they drive in highly populated zone. Next. And we've also modeled two scenarios of partial electrification of the cars and SUVs. So on the left, we have 20% of electric vehicles. On the, in the middle, we have 50% of electric cars and SUVs, and on the right, 100%. So you see that with low levels of electrification of the private vehicles, it's mainly the region of Toronto and Peel that benefits from an improvement of air quality. Um, but the greenhouse gas emission savings are proportional to the level of electrification. A key finding uh, of this comparison is that on, under all these scenarios, replacing one car or SUV by an electric vehicle leads to about $10,000 uh, of social benefits. Next. Yeah. Um, next.
Next, yeah. So now let's start to conclude uh, this presentation with some notes on policy implications. Thanks, Laura. Uh, and I, I realized that I didn't properly introduce you, uh, that Laura Minet is the, uh, the PhD student who, uh, working with the Transportation and Air Quality Research Group uh, with Marianne Hatsopoulou at the University of Toronto. Uh, Laura uh, put so much time and effort into this research and this modeling. So I really want to thank her for, uh, for putting so much into this, as well as everyone on the team as well. Um, so I'm going to really briefly talk about some of the policy solutions um, that we recommended in our report and along with our advisory committee as well. And uh, so <clears throat> these are, uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention that there's been a lot of talk about how the pandemic has led to a temporary drop in air pollution in, in many major cities as traffic volumes decline. Uh, but that we need to really look at permanent solutions to improve air quality and improve health and reduce greenhouse gas emissions as well. Because we're already seeing that in many cities, um, the, uh, the levels of pollution are starting to go back up again um, as people start to return to work and economies begin to reopen. And also um, from an ethical standpoint, a pandemic is not uh, a way that we want or need to reduce air pollution. Um, so what are some of these more permanent uh, solutions to reduce traffic related air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions? Um, okay, and uh, next slide, please. So I'll talk a little bit about it by scenario. Um, so we'll look at getting to 100% EVs. It's a really ambitious target, obviously because we're currently under 5% EVs on the road in Canada. Um, but it's a, it's a target that we do need to hit and that many policymakers have committed to hitting. Um, I should note that, as, as Laura said, we also modeled uh, a 20% uh, EV passenger vehicles and a 50% scenario. The 20% was one that we chose to reflect the ambition of current policies that we've seen from uh, municipal governments um, as well as federal governments. For example, the city of Toronto um, is, is aiming for 20% electrification, I believe by 2030. Um, so the 20% scenario that we looked at, the results were not nearly as effective as the 100% uh, electrification scenario, which to us represented that the policies we have in place now need to be stronger and they need to be faster. So that's why we're talking a little bit more about the 100% scenario, because achieving these big health outcomes is really, really important. Um, and achieving these big climate outcomes is really, really important. So to get to 100%, um, we obviously need stronger policy tools that are in place right now. And a, a zero emission vehicle mandate is something we've recommended in our report. Um, to briefly uh, just define what is a ZEV, we use the acronym ZEV a lot in the climate community. It means zero emission vehicle. Um, it's, uh, it's both electric vehicles and uh, hydrogen powered vehicles, any vehicle that is capable of running on zero emissions and not burning gas. Um, and a ZEV sales mandate uh, would require automakers to sell a gradually rising percentage of zero emission vehicles in their fleets. And it means essentially that automakers have to put their money where their mouth is. They have to actually advertise and they have to actually promote electric vehicles as much as they would for SUVs or pickups. And most folks on this call probably know that we have a problem with huge vehicles in Canada. Uh, they're responsible for a growing share of greenhouse gas emissions as well as air pollution. So a ZEV mandate is actually already in place in, in multiple provinces in Canada, uh, in California, in the US. And having this regulatory policy in place across Canada consistently, instead of in kind of a patchwork province, province would help speed up this shift uh, to zero emission vehicles and would help make things more consistent for customers and for automakers. And it also helps make sure that these vehicles are available when customers want them. Um, other policies can help speed up the transition. We mentioned keeping current purchase incentives, uh, building out charging infrastructure. There's lots more information in our report if you want to read about these. Uh, okay, next slide. Okay, um, so getting to cleaner trucks, as we know, is an incredibly important goal uh, for many of the reasons Laura mentioned, that they just have an absolutely huge impact on air pollution and our health. 
And they're also responsible for a growing proportion of greenhouse gas emissions in Canada. And as economic activity increases, we tend to see a corresponding increase in goods movement and trucking activity. So we really need to find a way to decouple uh, that economic growth from harmful pollution from trucks. Um, and so one of, some of the ways that we've recommended to do that are scrappage programs, uh, low emission zones where uh, vehicles coming into a densely populated area would have to uh, be a certain level of efficiency, um, incentives for cleaner trucks. Again, lots more information in the report if you wanna dig deeper into those. And then getting to 100% e-buses, um, that's something that many transit authorities and cities have actually started to commit to and act on. Um, however, things are starting a little bit slowly and we'd really love to see more e-buses on the road faster. Um, and to do that, it's gonna take uh, some funding. And uh, I was just actually reading about how Durham region um, finished a pilot project, which was funded by the gas tax, the federal gas tax to get more electric vehicles in their fleet. Uh, and actually the atmospheric fund is now funding uh, more work in Durham region in order to get uh, more electric buses on the road. And so we need to see more of these pilot projects and solutions uh, in order to get these e-buses on the road. And we wanna see commitments from transit authorities and from cities uh, to do that for the health of their residents. There's also an economic dimension to, uh, to cleaner electric buses because in Canada, we make a lot of electric buses. So as cities transition to buying more electric buses and adding them to their fleets, that can support good Canadian jobs as well. That's all I'm gonna say about the policy uh, for now. Again, tons more information in our report, but I wanna have time for your questions. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Marianne Hatsapulu and she's going to uh, lead you through uh, our Q&A portion. Yes, hi, thanks, uh, Sarah. Um, thank you everyone for attending. It's um, also acknowledging uh, uh, Laura, who is the lead researcher on, on this study, but also supported by a great team of uh, graduate students who worked on various aspects of this modeling. And I think we will have an acknowledgement slide uh, later on. I'm just happy to uh, translate some of the questions from the audience, and there are a few here, and I'm gonna go through them, and I'll direct them to the person involved. There are quite a bit related to modeling, so brace yourself, Laura. And if there's something that I can uh, pick up on, I will do so. Um, I, um, the first one I think starts with um, you, Sarah, and this is something that as a team we've, we've um, discussed a lot in terms of self-criticism, and it's the question of how are we linking these ideas of more electrification with, you know, behavior of population, with land use patterns, with the fact that we need to get people out of single-use vehicles because they don't need to drive so much to start with. Yeah, that's a great question. So we've talked a lot about the role of governments, uh, but we haven't talked as much about uh, people's behavior and, you know, for example, vehicle choices um, and influencing that behavior to get people to actually shift to these cleaner vehicles. Uh, and I would argue that getting governments to take action is, is a huge part of that behavior change. Um, because, for example, right now, there, there is an, an upfront price barrier to buying an electric vehicle. That's absolutely true. We know that over time, those vehicles tend to uh, save people more money because of uh, lower maintenance costs and lower gas costs, obviously. But we, it, it goes hand in hand. So we need governments to help create solutions uh, with things like purchase incentives or, uh, or a ZEV mandate to help consumers make those choices. Um, and, and also things like incorporating um, electric buses into, uh, into city fleets so that many consumers don't even realize they're making that choice to get on an electric bus um, because that's, that's a decision that uh, has been made by the municipality. Um, so there are tons of things that individuals can do, uh, obviously, to shift to those cleaner vehicles. But we have to acknowledge that often there's a cost involved that, that is prohibitive for people. So we need the help of governments as well to help bridge that gap and, and make that change together. Thanks, Sarah. I, I would maybe also add that, you know, one of the next steps of this work, if we ever take this work further uh, together with Sarah and Helen with Environmental Defense and OPHA, is looking at, you know, getting people out of their cars and into active transportation, looking what are the health effects of active transportation and public transit over and above, you know, technology changes is something we're very interested in. Um, there's another question here. 
and uh, perhaps uh, Sarah or Laura regarding the, the impact of, 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 of building electric cars and end of life of electric cars and battery technology that the entire study was based on just the operation, operational part of the life cycle of electric vehicles, but clearly there are more environmental impacts associated with building and, 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 um, and um, end of life of electric cars. So um, any comments on that? I can, I'm happy to quickly comment. Um, yeah, this question definitely comes up a lot um, and it's a good one. And it's one, the, the studies that I've looked at um, more recently, uh, there's been a lot more, thank goodness, a lot more studies looking at the entire life cycle of electric vehicles um, and you know whether they actually help or hinder when you consider things uh, like recycling those lithium batteries or building those batteries for electric vehicles. And the conclusion of the vast majority of these studies is that over their entire life cycle, that's from building to decommissioning, um, electric vehicles do provide a net uh, carbon reduction. And, um, but I think there's a lot more work to do in, in studying these environmental impacts. Building any car and decommissioning any car, whether it's an internal combustion engine vehicle or an electric vehicle has environmental impacts. That's absolutely true. Um, so when we talk about the environmental impacts of EVs, we also have to look at the environmental impacts of ICE vehicles. And I think that also speaks to Marianne's point that the, the best solutions, the absolute cleanest solutions are the ones that get people out of vehicles entirely because of that environmental footprint. Um, every time you build a car, every time you get in a car. Um, so if you don't get in a car at all, that's the absolute cleanest and healthiest thing. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, Laura, this is a question for you. Um, do the reductions in premature deaths in the scenario come mainly from air pollution reductions, um, PM 2.5, NO2, so what's driving these benefits? What's the significance of having GHG emissions if we actually haven't looked at the health impacts of uh, reductions in greenhouse gas emissions? And maybe uh, what air quality models have you used? Somebody's curious, was it CMAC, uh, CAMEX, uh, et cetera? Okay, uh, a lot of questions here. Um, um, so, the, well, just quickly, uh, the chemical transport model we used is called Porous 3D. It's part of a platform called Polyphemus, developed by a French lab called Syria. Um, the reason, okay, I'm trying to remember the questions. Um, <laughs> what was driving the reductions in premature Oh, death? yes. Um, so in our case, it was really reductions in anodu concentrations that were uh, driving um, the prevention of premature death. And the reason for this is that we made a choice of, uh, we considered, uh, we, co we decided to consider uh, acute exposure, the health impacts associated with acute exposure to NO2 in our analysis. And these are uh, clearly higher than uh, acute and uh, long-term exposure to uh, PM 2.5. Uh, exposure. So um, in our case, it was really NO2 exposure that was driving the health effects, uh, but black carbon exposure also played uh, a large role. Okay. And maybe finally, significance of having GHG emissions, um, since they're not really part of the health uh, benefits assessment. Well, we know there, there are climate and health benefits associated with reductions of uh, emissions of greenhouse uh, gases because this is going to impact climate change. Um, it's just difficult to quantify. Uh, and it's also a matter of comparing the skills between uh, air pollutant exposure uh, health effects and uh, climate change health effects. We decided not to quantify in terms of health benefits and social benefits, the greenhouse gas emission, the reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, because we were afraid that um, the scales were very different from health. And it's difficult right now with the current research to know uh, if our estimates of uh, um, social benefits associated with greenhouse gas emissions are uh, correct or not. Yeah, absolutely. The social cost of carbon is just highly debated. There are so many different variables out there. And, and, and truly, reductions in, in air pollution should speak for themselves because there are great health benefits to be gained. Um, another question for you, Laura, have you considered emissions from power plants? And, and why is it that, you know, we just don't see 
big increases in, in power plant emissions or in air pollution from prior plants as a result of just electrifying the entire region? So yes, we considered the emissions associated with uh, power plants producing the electricity for uh, fueling the electric vehicles. Um, we used the 2016 grid mix of Ontario uh, to allocate uh, the different sources of electricity. And uh, in 2016, it was only nine, uh, well, I think it was 9% of the electricity was produced by natural gas power plants. So it really represents a very small portion of the total electricity. And so that's why we have little emissions from power plants, even when we increase the demand due to uh, electric vehicles. Yeah, um, it would be very interesting to see if increased uh, demand of electric vehicles south of the border will actually increase emissions from coal-fired power plants and how they would affect our region. Uh, there's another question for you, Laura, from Elisabeth Galarno from uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada, saying they've recently used a similar platform to evaluate these effects. What were the greatest challenges in doing your modeling and how would you translate those to research priorities going forward? Uh, whether it's in the emission inventory, whether in the chemical processes? Uh, I think it's definitely uh, getting an accurate emission inventory. That's uh, the main challenge with running uh, this type of model. In our case, we were focusing on an urban area where traffic is clearly uh, the most important source of air pollutant emissions. And that's where we focused our energy. Uh, so we used results from traffic assignment models and emission factors associated with these results to build the most refined emission inventory possible for traffic. And I think uh, in our case, uh, this, was, this was enough in the sense that uh, in urban areas, the other types of emissions are not as important as this one. Uh, but uh, if the scope of the research were different, or if we were uh, encompassing a larger domain, it, was, it would clearly be uh, more work should be done on developing a very refined uh, emission inventory. And probably boundary conditions, boundary oh, conditions. Yeah, and boundary conditions as well. Yeah. Um, uh, Sarah, there's probably a question for you from Miriam Diamond is um, uh, we talked about, you know, EVs and then we said, but really we don't want millions of EVs on our highway system, we want to get people out of cars. And the question is, concerns that government investment in electric vehicles, which support the auto industry, might take funding away from public transit. Yeah, I think that's a really a really valid concern. And it's, it's one that I, I honestly don't have a perfect solution to, but I think that we all need to, to think about. And, and I think that's one of the reasons we, um, one of our key messages coming out of this is to push for investments in electrifying our, our transit systems and our buses, um, which, which I would argue in a time where we're also thinking about economic recovery um, post-COVID is, is arguably maybe even more important uh, than, um, than, for example, passenger vehicle incentives. I think they're all important, but being able to build our transit systems um, healthier and cleaner and better um, is something that can not only help support uh, our, our Canadian economy and build more jobs, um, but also finds its way into more people's lives. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't have a car. Um, I, I, but I do usually take transit a lot. And the only way that I would come in contact, honestly, with an electric vehicle would be to step on an electric bus and having that immediacy in my life is going to make me think about these issues and also help me be involved. So I think the governments need to think more broadly about electrification um, as much more than just passenger vehicles. Um, and I would also say that in terms of what governments can act on quickly, uh, because municipal governments and transit authorities um, have more power over those decisions of what vehicles get go in their fleets, um, that's a way that, that impacts um, can happen quickly and, and be accelerated. Uh, behavior change is incredibly difficult uh, and important, but uh, convincing people to uh, switch to electric vehicles is, is a whole other kettle of fish. I don't know if other people have, have thoughts on that. It's a really big question. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, oh, Helen, do you wanna? Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to, to add, I think like some of the other health co-benefits of looking at things like public transit 
or active transportation. So electric vehicle certainly is part of the solution, but it's multi-pronged. And if, if we look at investing in public transit and investing in compact communities, so someone else had commented that as the lockdown is lifted, maybe more people won't, people will be less inclined to be on public transit or to carpool. So there may be more cars on the road. So those other kinds of um, in, things that we have to do to have more sustainable transportation systems and more policies in place where maybe people are continue to work from home if they don't have to be on the road, that's gonna address things and having more access to public transit, making sure that it's the most convenient method of travel and active transport, or sorry, public transit also is a form of active transportation. So you're improving health through improving physical activity and you're also reducing air quality. So what we're presenting today in this report is part of a multi-pronged solution. Thank you. I also think, you know, if I can add one more thing, just investing in, in active transit infrastructure and bike lanes, uh, we're seeing many cities starting to, to do that more right now. Um, you know, in, in Toronto, they've uh, announced kilometers and kilometers more bike lanes. And I've had friends texting me who want to get out on their bikes and they haven't in years and they want someone to ride with them who, who cycles regularly. So, um, it, you know, again, it shouldn't take a pandemic to get us to invest in this kind of infrastructure to get people out of cars entirely. All right, uh, <laughs> lots of questions. I'm trying to distill. Uh, there's an interesting one uh, here uh, from uh, uh, Sally saying that the benefit to EV transition in Hamilton was found to be lower than expected, giving their air, sh especially that their airshed modeling for Hamilton indicated that traffic related emissions are very important, like 70% of, of the total. Yet, you know, transition to EV did not show that much uh, of a benefit in Hamilton. And the question is, would it, could it be that the transboundary impacts are so big that, you know, EV electrification of the vehicle fleet in Toronto would actually benefit Hamilton and, 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 and vice versa, but that possibly couldn't have been accounted for in the Hamilton modeling? Laura, do you want to take a stab at... Yeah, sure. I think um, the transboundary, well, the boundary conditions are very important. And so uh, we've seen that there's uh, a lot of pollution coming from uh, the U.S. And uh, since uh, the wind is mainly uh, southwest, um, it's Hamilton was uh, affected the most uh, and first uh, by this transboundary pollution. And so uh, electric, it, possible that electrification and electrification in Hamilton would benefit the region, other regions, uh, as much as uh, Hamilton in itself. Yeah, and, and I would add, I, I mean, it's, uh, you know, being in, in, in the city of Toronto, it's, it's not easy to say that, but clearly the emissions that are occurring in the city of Toronto and on the highway system are responsible for most of the air pollution in the entire GTHA. So I would say that any local, you know, any local initiatives are not, I mean, th th we're, we're living in the same airshed. So an initiative in Hamilton is gonna benefit everyone and an initiative in Toronto will benefit mostly everyone else, not just the residents of Toronto. And so this is why we often look at this entire region as a, as a region. And it's very hard to look at the impacts of localized improvements uh, on their own. Uh, we're at 12.59, I am uh, maybe, uh, is, do we have time for another um, question? Sure, yeah, I think we could do a last question. Oh, uh, we should also do our acknowledgement uh, slide as well. Tessa, I don't know if you wanna bring that up before we, just before we get to our last question. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge some of the folks who maybe we haven't mentioned yet um, and our project advisory committee members, some of the folks involved in the research as well. Um, thank you so much for making this project what it is. We had, um, we had such a great group, amazing discussions every time we had an advisory group meeting. <laughs> we always had to like cut them off because we were like getting too into it and um, this project wouldn't have been what it was without you. So thank you so much and thank you to our funders as well. Um, yeah, I guess let's go to our last question. No pressure, Marianne, and, and thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, uh, maybe last one. Uh, it's relevant because I think we haven't mentioned that and we've talked about wanting to mention that is about ozone, Laura. So somebody had talked about, you know, ozone as a secondary contaminant. Uh, do you want to say a yeah. few? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, 
we've seen with reductions of uh, NOx emissions and reductions of NO2 concentrations, we have, we have modeled uh, increases in ozone concentrations, uh, but those are very small compared to the reductions in uh, PM2.5 black carbon and NO2 concentrations. So yes, I mean, ozone is included in the model. We do see increases in ozone as we reduce NOx emissions, and it's important to acknowledge that, but, but, but the, the, they're highly offset by the decreases in NOx. Sarah, back at you. I think we're at 101. Okay, yeah, I was just trying to type in one last answer uh, to a question about a ZEV mandate in here. Um, well, 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 <laughs> but, <laughs> Uh, maybe I'll just very quickly say to Glenn uh, that there are, there's a question about whether there's ZEV mandates at the federal level. Um, no, we don't have a federal ZEV mandate. Quebec and BC both have uh, zero emission vehicle mandates, but there are policies at the federal level, like, um, like a greenhouse gas emission vehicle fleet average efficiency standard that is gradually shifting automakers to having to have more um, uh, carbon, less carbon intensive fleets over time. Uh, again, we want to see those strengthened. Um, and that's, that's all in the report. There's lots more info about that. Um, I couldn't resist a last policy nerd question there. Uh, so thank you so much to everyone who came. Uh, it's fantastic to see. Uh, I think we had almost 100 people on this call today. And I really, really thank you. And um, if you have any questions about the work, I've popped my email address in there and I can help redirect your questions to any of the team members here. Um, and uh, again, clearingtheair.ca, you can find lots of stuff. And uh, thanks so much for coming today. Bye. Thank you.